So this image that you see here is actually the original of the blue marble images. It's said to be one of the most reproduced images in human history. I can recall seeing it as a child and finding it quite simply awe-inspiring. I think that you can't help but look at it and it generates so many different thoughts and emotions. The perfect simplicity of our spherical planet versus the compelling complexity of the systems at play upon it. What's essentially just a dot in space versus the boldness of human progress in capturing that image. And perhaps most importantly, I think you can't help but look at it and then pause and think about us as our species and the profound implications that we have living on that planet. And so what I want to do in this talk now is describe how we can assess the impact that we are having on this planet, how we can undertake a planetary health check. Now, since that original image was taken by the Apollo spacecraft in 1972, in the subsequent, well, almost 50 years, there have been literally hundreds of petabytes of data acquired from space describing all aspects of our planet. And here are three recent satellite images. The amount of data that was being added to that repository now amounts to some tens of terabytes a day, which is equivalent per hour to adding an entire football pitch full of four drawer filing cabinets worth of information. It's really vast quantities of data that are being acquired all the time. I'll come on to describe in more detail what each of these images show, but I want to just go back to this image um, from the uh, Apollo spacecraft of the Earth. And um, one of the things that becomes really obvious when you look at the world from space is actually just how fragile it is. The thinness of our atmosphere is equivalent to the thinness of a skin of an apple in relative terms. And I think that gives us an impression of just how actually vulnerable our planet is. It's so huge, and yet, um, as a species, we have been able to scar that planet through our behaviour. And so that's what I want to explore in a little bit more detail now in undertaking that planetary health check. But let's just start by looking at some of the data that describes how we have been evolving over the last 150 years or so, as we've been moving through what people are increasingly calling the Anthropocene, the era of the world which has been largely shaped by humans. So if we look at human population over the last 150 years, it's increased about sixfold. As population has increased, society has developed in many countries of the world, transformed indeed, and a metric we often use to describe that progress is GDP. And we've seen that global GDP has increased about 100-fold over the last 150 years. Much of that transformation has been driven by industrialization. And that's been powered primarily through the use of fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas. Indeed, globally, energy use um, from both domestic and human uses has also increased dramatically, about 20-fold. And we've also been changing our land surface. So if we look, for example, um, at the area that's covered by tropical forests, it's decreased dramatically as we've been chopping down trees for settlements and for farming. So let's come back and say, what are the implications of this for the state of our planet? And what does the data tell us about that? Well, it may have come as no surprise, given the images I showed initially of the thinness of our atmosphere, that this explosion of human activity has been altering our atmosphere. Burning of fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide, chopping down trees, damaging soils, similarly release 
releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we've seen that carbon dioxide levels have increased by about 45% over that time period. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, so you put more of it into the atmosphere and temperatures increase. And we've seen the temperatures increase by about one degree centigrade over the last 150 years. Just as we use temperature to indicate our own health, we take our body temperatures, so temperature, global averaged across all the land and the oceans, um, gives us an indication of the health of the planet. And indeed, it's been used to enable us to answer the questions, is our climate changing? And is that change largely human-induced? And in fact, the international response to climate change, as characterized through the Paris Climate Agreement of last year, is framed entirely around temperature targets. It commits those signatories of that agreement to keep global temperatures below, well below 2 degrees centigrade increase, with an ambition to keep them below 1.5 degrees increase. But if we want to fully understand our impact on the world, perhaps we need to have a greater range of vital signs that we look at. If we look at sea level rise, for example, that is perhaps more directly relevant to people's lives than global average surface temperature, in particular for populations who live close to the coast and are vulnerable to that sea level rise. And we've seen an increase of 20 centimetres or so in sea levels over the last 150 years. We can look at other measures as well. Arctic sea ice, for example, um, is perhaps a more tangible, certainly more visible sign of the changes to our climate. And we've seen a dramatic decrease in sea ice, particularly at the end of the melt season in, in this time of year, in, in September. Um, if we look back just to the end of the 20th century and look at the typical area covered by sea ice, then compared to now, now, the sea ice typically only occupies two-thirds of the area that it did back at the end of the 20th century. When that sea ice melts, because it's already floating, it doesn't raise sea levels, but change on that scale can alter weather patterns across um, North America, Asia, and, and Europe. And so together, we're starting to get an idea of, a, if you like, a dashboard of planetary vital signs and how they're changing. Another candidate vital sign um, is the amount of heat content of the ocean. And indeed, this is in a way a more fundamental measure of how we're changing our climate. About 90% of the excess energy accumulated in the Earth system as a consequence of the greenhouse effect goes into the ocean. We don't have a long record of global heat content, but for the last decade or so, a fleet of almost 4,000 underwater instruments have been sampling the ocean, measuring its heat content, sending the data back via satellite. Um, and so we've been able to build up this record that clearly shows a warming world. Now, if we want to understand what the implications of that warming world for people are and for their lives, then we need information not just at this global scale, but we need information at a local and regional scale. And that brings me back to the images that I showed at the start. I want to describe how Earth observation from satellites and other data, together with data analytics, is transforming our abilities to do a health check of the planet and a very broad spectrum um, health check. So the first example that I want to give you is from the physical world. This is a satellite image of the Larsen C ice shelf. This year, um, the Larsen Sea ice shelf, a large crack formed, which we tracked via satellite. These images that you're seeing here um, are radar satellite images, which show the deformation of the surface of that ice sheet as the crack um, lengthened and eventually broke free. Um, when that occurred, a huge iceberg carved off the edge of the um, ice shelf. And in fact, I've got a satellite image of that ice shelf taken just Yesterday, this iceberg is the size of Luxembourg and is a trillion tons. It is a huge scale. These carving events are a natural part of the evolution of an ice shelf, but I think they're a clear indication of the scale of change that, 
that can occur rapidly in the polar regions. Our real concern is that even modest temperature increases are thought to potentially threaten the ice sheets that are grounded on land in West Antarctica and Greenland. And the concern is that if those ice sheets disintegrated, um, then we would eventually see many metres of sea level rise transforming global coastlines. So monitoring um, these changes is incredibly important. One of the things that I think is really exciting that we're driving forward um, at the moment are new techniques to try to understand how we can meld together observational data and computer simulations, in particular using machine learning techniques. These are the techniques that are helping us to automatically translate documents from Finnish to English um, or um, identify the image of a cat on the internet. And we're using exactly these techniques um, to try to identify patterns in historical data and then combine them with computer modeling to get a better understanding of the current changes and future changes to our planet. So, for example, we've been looking at Arctic sea ice, something that's traditionally very difficult to predict, and to see whether we can use these sort of techniques to bring together the past data, some of it from um, other sources, ships' records and so forth, um, together with climate model information and improve our projections. The next example that I want to give you is from the human world, this is a satellite picture of some terrible mudslides that occurred in Sierra Leone just a month or so ago. What happened is that there was huge unplanned development around the capital city in Sierra Leone, Freetown, um, along with unrestricted deforestation of the surrounding hillsides. That meant when there was a very wet, rainy season, deadly floods ensued. What we're trying to do is bring together data on the environmental conditions with data on other aspects of um, these communities in terms of um, health data, in terms of poverty data, bring them together in a big data framework so that we can get a better handle on some of the critical issues and help understand the changing exposure and vulnerability of these communities, how we can build resilience in these communities, and how we can foster sustainable um, development. And so it's linking up the weather and climate data with environmental health and poverty data. Some of that acquired from um, Earth observation, from satellite data. We're able to track the building of new um, infrastructure, the cultivation of lands, the diminishing water resources, for example, using machine learning techniques. Put that together with weather and climate data and then also integrate other sources of data. That might be sensor networks telling us about air quality on the ground. It might be linking in household surveys or other community-based um, data gathering projects. And the ambition is that through doing that, we can drive forward a new field of environmental data science that addresses some of the key global challenges. The very final example that I want to give is from the animal world, and here are our penguins. Um, this particular image, the brown stains that you see are in fact penguin poo, as viewed from space. And what colleagues of mine in the British Antarctic Survey are doing are using these satellite pictures to identify penguin colonies and then looking at the very high resolution sensors on the satellites to actually estimate the number of penguins in those colonies. And by doing this, they've identified twice the number of colonies that were previously um, thought to exist. What's now being done is trying to use this kind of data to understand how those penguin colonies are faring in the face of changing sea ice conditions and other climatic changes. Now, what I've been describing is the world um, as it's been changing through this era of the Anthropocene. I'm trying to give you an indication of the very broad range of different data, much 
much of it taken from space that can help us to build up an assessment of the state of the planet, the health of the planet, its vital signs. And it's clear that it's never been more important to keep track of those vital signs as we're putting the planet under increasing stress. It was mentioned in the introduction that I co-wrote uh, the Ladybird book on climate change with um, His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. And in it, you know, he spoke very much to this when he said, if the pa planet were a patient, we would have attended to her long ago. Now, I started with an image that inspired me as a child of the Earth from space, and I'm going to just finish with, with this image, which is the image that inspires me now the most. Uh, this is a picture of my daughter, Genevieve, and my grandmother. It was taken shortly before my grandmother died. She was in her 90s. And I look at it, and I think that when my daughter is the age that my grandmother was in this picture. It will be the end of the century. I question what world will she live through. It's clearly vitally important that we gather the data in terms of how the world is changing so that we can base our decisions today that will impact our children's future on hard data and evidence of how that change, what our impact on the planet is. Of course, what's critical is how we then choose to act on that knowledge. And that, of course, is going to be the legacy that we leave to the children of today. Thank you. Thank you.